What's up, my comic comrades? Back in December of last year, we partnered with Comic Tom and Jeff the Golden Age Guru to kick off a new series focused on the four unique ages in comic book history. The Golden Age, Silver Age, Bronze Age, and Modern Age. Tom and Jeff walked us through the Golden Age back in December, where we looked at the birth of the comic book industry and how it evolved over its first couple decades, including the role comics played in the Second World War. In comics and in life, you need to know your history, so you definitely want to give that a watch, which you could do right here. But that, of course, brings us to the topic of today's episode. Episode, the Silver Age. This time period in comics is marked by the incredible growth and creative explosion led by a roster of powerhouse creators and artists that include Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, John Romita Sr., Steve Ditko, John Buscema, Bob Haney, and the list goes on. Which is why we were excited to have Comic Tom and the Golden Age Guru back to highlight the most important comics and characters to come out of that era and explain how they impacted or changed the industry as we know it. So now I'm gonna shut up and let these guys bring you the Silver Age knowledge. Variant Nation, we back. We saw your comments on that last Golden Age video. We had to come back. We know you guys want a breakdown of the Silver Age. We also brought some Silver Age goodies for the community. Make sure to stay tuned to the end of the video to get some first print comics. 12 cent goodies, guys, and their keys. This is the remastering of so many superheroes that everybody knows. And I'm sitting here with Overstreet Price Guide Advisor, the Golden Age Guru. We are taking a break from our channel, Comic Tom 101, and we're going to bring you this significant time frame in comics that you gotta know, and it's gonna come to you in a way that you have not seen it before. Yeah, make sure to slap the like button. Let us know if you wanna see more eras covered for the Variant Nation, because we have to go over one of the most pivotal times in comic book history. And it really starts in the 1950s, post the Golden Age, because only three superheroes even survived it. Three separate titles survived the Golden Age. We had Wonder Woman, we had Batman, and we had Superman. Now, if you missed out on that Golden Age video, you can check it out. But we end that era with the Golden Age, the comic industry, doing some self-regulation, putting a muzzle on creativity and what titles could even be published. Our time frame is 1956. And we're going to start off the mid-50s with an excitement about science, an excitement about speed, class, and kind of the American dream. And we're going to end the Silver Age in the 1970s with a revolution. I'm not going to start off this time frame with a book. I'm going to start off with a person. We have DC Stanley, if you will. Jules like Schwartz. He was a visionary. He was an editor there. And he actually saw an opening for revitalized potential in superheroes. Superheroes have not been successful since the mid 40s. So we're talking here about 56 right now. And it's going to start off with the character in that book that you have in your hands right now. Yeah, more like my sweaty hands. This is a $15,000 book I'll put back down. Flash, after he had been canceled since 1951. You mentioned 1956 is when we had Jules reach out to Carmine Infantino to redesign this character to change superheroes forever. And notice the Flash is red. Notice that he is sleek. He is fast. He is a reflection of the 1950s Americana. There's an influence of science to these characters that we're going to be discussing now and shortly. And that was exactly what's happened with Barry Allen's background. He's a scientist in a police department. So you wonder, why is it showcase? Why isn't it just Flash? Because this is the trial title. This was somewhere where they could explore what's going to work. Now, the first three issues failed, and this was a success. Two issues later, we had showcase number six, and we had another team. This is the first Silver Age hero team. And this was Challengers of the Unknown. And it was created by none other than Jack the King Kirby, who is going to be a huge influence in Marvel's historical launch pad in just a short five, six years from now. What's with all this exploration talk? Well, it's because we were in the space race at this time. Remind you, in 1957, we have the USSR sending their first satellite into space, traveling at 18,000 miles an hour, going over American cities and states, scaring a lot of citizens. It's putting us in a position to start looking to the stars for advancement in science for our security. We have your Showcase 22. This is the re-envisionment of the Golden Age Green Lantern, Alan Scott, and now we have Hal Jordan here. Okay, we have the government who's allegedly here to protect us, and that's the, the thought process here in the 50s. This is a government employee. He's an Air Force fighter. And he now has this encounter with a, a space alien and gets these abilities through his Green Lantern ring. 
And now we have a space police type of concept. We're getting further out there. It's becoming more intergalactic. You're going to see this as a reoccurring theme as we go throughout this era. You have characters like Hawkman being brought into the Silver Age with a completely different backstory. You have characters that are literally named after like science itself in issue 34 of showcase with the atom dealing with things on a molecular level prototype characters getting a second shot let's enter the 1960s your heroes are individually firing at all cylinders so what's the next step let's do a team up let's revamp the justice society of america a golden age superhero squad okay to now have the justice league of america you're gonna have your biggest heroes under one title okay this is the brave and the bold number 28 where you have wonder woman Superman, Batman, Green Lantern, The Flash, Aquaman, and on and on and on. It was a revolving cast. But what it really was, was a major hit. Now, this wouldn't go unnoticed. Over at Atlas Comics, you have Martin Goodman, who would actually want a taste of this success. He would famously seek out one of his workers, a family member named Stan Lee, and tell him that they needed more heroes. And... He wants to see a superhero team on their title. This is the moment where Marvel is truly, truly born. 1961, they changed the name officially to Marvel. 1961, we have the Fantastic Four. Stanley, Jack, Kirby collaborate. Okay, and a lot of people are going to disagree, Stanley or Jack Kirby. I'm telling you, it's a collaboration. That's right. I mean, not just collaboration among writers and artists. It is well known that Joan Lee, Stanley's wife, actually gave him the inspiration to write what he wanted. She famously put it this way. This could be a chance for you to do it in the way you've always wanted and create characters who have interesting personalities, who speak like real people. And this is exactly what we got. We had a superhero team of four, just like Challenge of the Unknown, but we have a gritty history to them. They fought. They had issues. They had superpowers, but they weren't powers that everyone wanted. Dude, they didn't have secret identities. They had to do something very different than DC, not just for marketing reasons, but because DC was actually doing the distribution for Marvel at the time. Exactly. Marvel lost their distribution in the late 50s. So they had to go through DC. DC did not think Marvel was competition. And they were only allowed to publish eight titles a month. And that brings us to the next star hero that wouldn't really gain traction until a little bit later. We see Bruce Banner. We see the Hulk. Martin Goodman was really good at following trends. And something that he noticed in 1961 was the most famous toy that hit the stands. It was a green Frankenstein. And I'll remind you that Paramount Pictures, when they released this movie, Frankenstein was gray. So it makes sense that when Martin Goodman would approach Stan Lee to make a monster type superhero based off of this toy, that Stan Lee would think, oh, I better make a gray monster. According to lore, Martin Goodman obviously can see that this is a gray Hulk and was not happy with that. He wanted the green Hulk toy. So we see in issue two, the very next book, Hulk smashing through a wall in green skin. Dude, and I love that you said smashing because that is what the king did. Jack Kirby, he drew exaggerated anatomy. He drew power in those pencils. And that's what he became known for. And he would affect every artist at that time and inspire generations. We have clearly discussed how the Golden Age was revamped through DC. Well, we're going to see that now in Marvel. In Fantastic Four number four, we're going to see a Golden Age hero from Marvel's history make its first Silver Age appearance. We see the Submariner, whose origin has now changed. He's had amnesia. He gets his memory back and realizes who he is. And he's actually, again, just like in the Golden Age, an anti-hero, but for the Silver Age. We see in Flash issue 123 DC breaking the barriers again with the Flash, bringing in Jay Garrick, the Golden Age version. Now we're crossing eras. This has never been done before. And universes and dimensions are now being created. Yeah, this is the first time we're going to hear about an Earth 2. A crisis. Yeah, it explains where these Golden Age heroes have come from. And then what these Silver Age heroes are located. And Flash can vibrate at a frequency to get to them. Makes sense, because of comic books, why these characters were able to be revitalized from the past. Just like in this next issue that I'm holding right here, Avengers issue number 4, where we see Captain America, a Golden Age hero, 
still young in the Silver Age? Again, that's that comic sense we're talking about here because he has been thawed all right, after being in a frozen state and found and realized that this is the original Golden Age Cap who is now with us in the Silver Age. Whatever they had to do. And it worked. We were seeing some serious success for Marvel for these titles. And DC had more of a younger readership they're going for with the way they were telling stories. But this was grittier. Okay, it was for more mature readers. It was more relatable. That's what brought us into this Marvel age. And it really started back in 1962 in September with their most famous character, the sensational, the spectacular, the amazing Spider-Man in Amazing Fantasy issue number 15 with a Kirby cover, Steve Ditko art on the interiors and Stan Lee story. We're talking about a high school kid here who gets his powers and abilities from a radioactive spider. Okay, he's lovable, he's realistic. Um, all these Marvel stories are taking place in real cities, not like DC who has it in fanciful cities like Gotham City, Metropolis, uh, Central City. We have this in Manhattan, in New York. He doesn't look as sleek and as super as Hal Jordan. No, he looks like a high school student struggling with girls, struggling with the fact that he's so smart, but has this responsibility to be a superhero with superpowers, to pay the rent, to take care of his elderly family member. This is somebody that was unlike any DC hero at the time. Now, as great as Steve Ditko's concept and design was for Spidey, it was even better for Doctor Strange. In Strange Tales 110, we see his first appearance and the way that he was able to draw mysticism and magic was like no other ever seen on the pages of a comic. We also see in 1963, Tales of Suspense, issue number 39, a Kirby created character, Iron Man, Tony Stark hitting the pages, but it wouldn't be until issue number 48 that he would begin to look more like the hero that we know him to be. And that's because of Steve Ditko. He did something similar that he did to Amazing Spider-Man, and he retrofitted a character that was just created just a few issues before. And this is an interesting character because he wasn't created necessarily to love. He was actually almost created necessarily to hate because he was an arms dealer. All right, and that was a big deal at the time. We're talking about this counterculture here. We're already seeing war all right, in the background. Which, and there's been a subset of tension through the 50s, which is really going to build up through the 60s here. As, and, and it's going to be evident in the comics that we see. Now we move on to another creation by Stan the Man and Jack the King Kirby. We have in Journey into Mystery 83, the creation of the most exciting superhero of all time. Thor. This isn't a version of Thor that is essentially Superman with Viking clothes on. No, this is a king. This is a god. And this offered Jack the ability to bring in deities, demons, cosmic writings, warriors into the pages of the Silver Age. What do you do when distribution is the way it is and you're restricted? What do you do with all of these heroes? They're all popping, but you can't give them all solo series. Well, the first thing you do is you form a new team. September 1963, we have the introduction of the Avengers. Now, we've been seeing a lot of science affect characters, so, so we're going to do something different here. We're going to have a team that's born with abilities. They're going to have their own challenges. They're going to grow up in their own environments, and we're going to have the first appearance of the X-Men. Issue number one hits the newsstand the same month as Avengers number one. Now, all these Marvel heroes are becoming fan favorites. I mean, they're actually hitting the mainstream now, being read in colleges. The Beatles loved Marvel Comics. And this is a time now where you see DC starting to struggle. Batman, one of the trifecta to reach through the Golden Age, is struggling. And he would continue to struggle until 1966. All right, this is two years after the JFK assassination. This is a year after getting to Vietnam War. And we have that show. Whether you hate it or love it, that show was a juggernaut at the time. Okay, it was well-loved, well-received. And it brought a lot of life to the comic industry and not just Batman. Batman 66 wouldn't just affect comic sales. No, it would actually take the producer of the show to influence a new character. We have Barbara Gordon being introduced in issue number 359 after a request for a new female superhero. We got Batgirl. 
That same year, 66, we got to see one of the largest characters of all time, Galactus. And the Silver Surfer, a herald for Galactus. These are two epic, epic characters that will stand the time of Marvel's history and be used over and over again. And they're some of the greatest creations ever. And again, the storytelling by Stan Lee continues to push these characters forward. And we get into something a little bit more serious. We're having this counterculture movement right now. Okay. And we see an FF52. Yeah, just three months later. We get the first African descent superhero ever in comics with the Black Panther. So part of the times was an anti-war sentiment, right? It was very, very large to the fact that it affected the pages of comics. Again, we're seeing that reflected in one of the oldest heroes in comics for war, Sergeant Rock, in issue Army of War 196, we see him trying to put a stop and saying he wants out. This is a character who lives on war. Also something that doesn't get talked about enough is that in the Silver Age at this time, we see underground comics starting to be created. We're seeing issues that focus on things that wouldn't be approved by the comic code. Things about free love, about recreational drug use, and, and all the rest. But it was these types of underground comics with examples like you just gave, where it was so against the norm that we are now seeing the beginning to the end of this era. Now, I'm not trying to get too heavy here, guys. But at this time, it's not looking too good for DC. They just had the successful show of Batman, but that's beginning to wane. And they are unable to connect with readership, not like Marvel, who's down to earth. They're gritty. They, they get it. The distribution agreement has now officially changed. What are some of the titles we're now seeing? No more shared titles. They now get to have their heroes alone. And they get to flood the stands with all kinds of issues. We see Silver Surfer 1. We see Iron Man 1. Submariner 1, Captain America 100, which is the first in his own title, Hulk 102, this is the first issue in his own title, and it's one of the giveaways today. DC Comics was shaking in their boots at this time. Green Lantern, The Flash, these heroes that were popping just years earlier are now about to get canceled. Batman at an all-time low, but fortunately, their savior came in the form of a legend who is still killing it to this day. Neil Adams starts doing inks, he starts doing pencils, and now he's taking over Batman, changing him forever. If Stan Lee and Jack Kirby get credit for revitalizing characters, Carmine Infantino revitalizing Flash, then Neil Adams gets credit for making Batman, Bruce Wayne, the Dark Knight. And he was also able to transform other characters. He transformed Dead Man into something more special than what he was. It's same thing with Green Arrow. Now in 1970, Neil Adams saw something he did not like. Green Lantern was about to go out of business. It's going to be canceled. So he wanted to give it a shot. He wanted to put his pencils to that paper to see if he can save it. And he teamed up with a legendary writer who actually passed away earlier this year, Dennis O'Neill. And they would go on to make one of the most important comic books in history. But that conversation is for another day when we chat about the Bronze Age of Comic Books. Now, we did mention we have some giveaways. We also have some recommended reads for you. Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. issue number two. We have Jim Steranko, my all-time favorite Silver Age artist who introduced fine art, surrealism into comic books. And I recommend everyone check out Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. The first few issues, so good. So the next two giveaways are these two FF keys. You got the first in humans and you got the second appearance of Black Panther in an origin story. Now, my recommended read is that you read from 45 to 52 at least, guys. You'll get the first appearance of Galactus. You'll get the first appearance of Silver Surfer and the first appearance of Black Panther. Amazing reads, great artwork. Can't recommend it enough. We talked about The Flash enough in this video, so we're going to be doing a giveaway that features Barry Allen and the Golden Age Flash crossing over in this issue of Flash 137. And as promised, guys, one of our giveaways, Hulk 102. This is the first big premiere issue where he gets his own title. This is the ground level of where you want to start to read this, guys. And as Hulk loves to do, he loves to smash. So smash that like button, guys. And if you get this book, don't smash it. Just read it. Hit that subscribe button because you don't want to miss out on any great content that you can find on this channel. And come say hi over at Comic Tom 101 where we talk about collectible comics on the daily. As always, geek 
responsibly. Enough said. What did we tell you? Not only did Tom and Jeff bring their incredible knowledge, but they also brought the heat with five amazing Silver Age comics known as 12 Centers to give away to five members of the Variant Nation. As Tom and Jeff mentioned, the five comics you have a chance to win to add to your collection are Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. issue 2 by Jim Steranko, Fantastic Four issue 45, which is the first appearance of the Inhumans. Then we have Fantastic Four issue 53, which is the second appearance of Black Panther in comics. Then we have Flash issue 137, which is the first Silver Age appearance of the JSA and has Barry Allen squaring off against the Golden Age Flash, Jay Garrick. And the last but certainly not least title in this epic Silver Age giveaway is The Incredible Hulk issue 102, which of course is the Hulk's return to his very own title. This will basically be a lottery system. So the first place winner will get their pick of the five comics available, then the second place winner will get their pick from the four remaining, and so on, with the fifth place winner getting the final comic left. But getting any of these valuable books is a major win, so outside of preference, it doesn't matter a ton. But how can you be one of those lucky winners, you ask? Well, all you have to do is head over to variantcomics.com forward slash giveaways and complete the entry form. Then be sure you're subscribed to our channel here on YouTube and then follow us on either Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, or feel free to follow all of them if you like. You must be 18 to enter and it's only one entry per person. And you have from today, July 12th through Sunday, July 19th to jump in. Then the winners will be announced right here on the Variant channel, as well as on our social media platforms on July 22nd. But don't wait, click the giveaway link in the description now to give yourself a chance to own one of these awesome pieces of history. And speaking of links in the description, description, we want to give a huge thanks to Comic Tom and the Golden Age Guru for laying down the Silver Age goodness today. And for making this killer giveaway possible, click all their links in the description, subscribe to their channels, and follow them on social media. Show them some love, people. I'm telling you, if you're a collector on any level or just a comic book fan in general, these are two guys you absolutely need to be following. But with all that said, that brings today's episode to a close. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and if you like this episode, be sure to check out our History of the Golden Age episode right here. But other than that, be sure to like our channel, subscribe, and comment. It always helps us out. But I'll see you guys next time when we talk about all things comics.